Hello and welcome to this Premier League review special. I am Harry Masterson. And I'm AJ Emerson Top. And I've got to say, Harry, you are looking very dapper tonight. <sighs> yep, obviously, of course, with uh, any spoilers for the Predictor League, of course, I was the one that lost. And this is the forfeit. Mass- massive Man United fan, but I'm sat here wearing the arch rivals jersey. So let's begin with how, well, let's see how we got into this situation. Or should I say how you got into this situation? (laughs) Let's discuss the players that were chosen. Obviously, you had your top four and then it was announced. Luke Littler was in the Premier League. And we mentioned it way back, it feels like, in episode one, where I had my reservations, not on the player, Luke is a phenomenal talent. You know, we got to the world final, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I was just more worried for him because going without being playing on even a pro tour event, he was thrown into this Premier League event. And I was worried personally that, you know, it might be too much for him too soon, not because of his age, but because he was literally a new tour card holder and was put into this situation. But as the weeks progressed, he proved everybody wrong. No, I completely agree. And um, when the lineup was announced, I think when um, after what he'd done at the World Championships, he had earned that right to be picked for the Premier League. There was no doubt in my mind when that announce was announced that he was he was earning of that spot. And one thing I will say as well is that. You've had players in the past, like I remember Gerwin Price, I remember Mark Webster even a few years ago when he got picked for the Premier League for the first time, Kim Hybrex, Yellow Klassen. These are all players that have... Stephen Bunting. Stephen Bunting, exactly. All these players have um, been introduced to the Premier League for the first time and not performed to the standards that we know that they're actually capable of. Some players have even walked out of the Premier League thinking, I don't want to play darts anymore because of how brutal it can be. But um, Littler, obviously, with that World Championship run, I reckon he would have been thinking, well, if I've done the World Championship, which is the biggest tournament of the lot, then the Premier League should also be absolutely fine. And with the early weeks that went on, we saw that he just got to grips with it almost instantly. And and the quote that I remember the most, where we both just stood there, well, sat there laughing. I think I know what was, you're going to say. Yeah, I'm just going to treat it as a practice night. Yeah, the Premier League, and it was practice night. And you know, I've known Luke for a long time playing locally, and it is a far cry playing on a Thursday in Swinton, but then playing on a Thursday in a different city in a different country with so many eyes glued to every move you're making. It was a lot for Luke to take, and he succeeded. No, absolutely. And you look at the numbers that, like you, as you mentioned, you go into different cities, you go into different countries now with the Premier League format every single Thursday with big crowds. Like you look at the three arena in Dublin, that's a massive arena. You look at Rotterdam as well, that's huge. And he just went to all these places and just he showcased his talent like he did at the Ali Pali. Yeah, yeah, absolutely amazing. And Let's go right to the very beginning of this year's Premier League at Cardiff, where Michael Smith was the surprise. Well, I wouldn't say surprise, but with all the headlines being on Luke Littler and you know with Gary Price being in, in Cardiff as well, they were the main names, but Michael Smith came out with the win in that first week. And then it was all about MVG. Yes, of course. Michael Smith was, the, in fact, the first winner of the Premier League. He... Um, won in night one in Cardiff, beating Price, going Price in the final. And I remember there was the battle of the world champions as well. Uh, sorry, the, there was a battle of the world final in the quarterfinals between Humphreys and Littler. But as you said, it was the MVG show. Defending champion, won the Premier League the last two years. And it was a, a hat-trick for him very early on, which was making everyone wonder after that, is he going to walk the league? Yeah, it that for the first uh, four weeks and Michael Van Gogh winning three out of the first four, we were standing here and you know talking and going, you know, is this going to be one of them dominant runs that Michael Van Gogh is known for? And it's a tailor of old with uh, the 
previous Premier League formats? Was it going to be the, a one-man show? But then over the next few weeks, we was getting different when it's, uh, because Nathan Aspinall put one to his credit and then Luke Humphreys put one to his credit. And then it it was just each and every week we was, got, we was stumped for the Predictor League because every week it was a different winner or it was a couple of weeks on the spin. But the quarterfinals, it was harder to pick than a broken nose. Exactly. With the shorter format as well, it was extremely hard. I think a lot of times when we were doing the predictor league, it was a case of who's going to edge a last leg decider because a lot of the games and how close the players are in terms of quality, you just automatically assumed that the games were going to be going the distance. And looking back after MVG won the four, the three nights in uh, Berlin, Glasgow and Newcastle, I think Aspinall won the night in Exeter literally just before the UK Open started. And then it yes. was a following on from an MVG hat trick in nights two to four. It was a Humphreys hat trick from nights six to eight. Yeah, Luke really came into his own then. I think, you know, it was a bedded in period, so to speak, in this Premier League format because you had two debutants, both called Luke, and uh, both of them were starting to get a feel for it, is the best way I could put it. I think I remember when um, we were talking, like obviously moving on to Luke Little here with the early weeks. Um, obviously, we know that he didn't win a night until a little bit later on. But the most important thing was that he had a bit, like, I think I mentioned this in episodes around these Premier League nights, but with um, Nathan Aspinall's uh, campaign last year, he wasn't winning many nights, but he was obviously winning every quarter final that he played so he was rallying um racking up the points I should say each week and Littler was sort of doing the same thing earlier on in the competition always getting past the quarterfinals and looking back as to where he ended up finishing in the league that early part of the campaign was so important as much as what he did at the end reminds me of the tortoise and the hare <laughs> slow and steady wins the race started slow wasn't winning any nights like Van Gerwen and, Lit and Humphreys were, but he was picking up the two points each week. And as you know, um, some players, like you look at Peter Wright, he was not winning as many um, quarterfinals early on, which was putting him a lot behind the rest of the field. But Littler was not winning the nights, but he was keeping himself around mid-table. And in fact, I think he was in the top four around the uh, early weeks, even though he didn't win the night, uh, win a night, I should say. He was always in contention. It always felt like he. It, it, we all said it, it's just going to be one week where it'll happen and then the rest was history. And I think watching how he just progressed, as we said, week by week by week, and then it was week nine. So it was just over the halfway stage where Luke got his first win at Belfast and then doubled it up in Manchester. And then... Michael Van Gerwen got his fourth. So then you could see it was always, they were always talking to him and, you know, the, the format added to that where with it, the different week, there was seemed to be more, more of the story of the Premier League was developing. It looked a case of players getting um like getting into like a winning streak. Obviously you saw Van Gerwen with the winning streak early on, Luke Humphreys with the winning streak in... Brighton, then he won in Nottingham, and Nottingham was a fantastic night, by the way. Don't even um, question like, in terms of the quality that was shown on that occasion. And then you also get Dublin on night eight that he won. And then it swings to the other Luke with him winning in Belfast and uh, Manchester, of course. And then it went back to it swung back to Van Gerwen again in Birmingham. And I actually remember, even though I lost the Predictor League, I do remember predicting that Van Gerwen was going to win that night. So Every cloud has a silver lining, I suppose, but of course, wearing the awful shirt at the minute and that's the repercussion <laughs> of it. Thanks to the uh, the Leeds double, as we was calling it, the last two weeks where the Yorkshire double, the Yorkshire double, the Yorkshire double, where Luke Humphreys won both of them. So at the end of the league format, you had three players winning four nights, which I think is a first. Yes, I um I definitely think that's the first. I don't think three players have ever won four nights. I actually remember in the first format, I don't think a single player won four nights. And I think last year it was broken with Price doing it. And then I don't know if Smith did it as well. I know I think Price got four wins. And then this year it's just been, it's mad how 
three quarters of the league phase was won by three players. Yeah, there is, and the stats that you when you talk about the the averages and the number of one seventies hit and the number of one eighties hit, it was the headlines just kept going up and up and up. And it, it there's a phrase I use is where if you're talking to someone and it's like they always do one upmanship where how big your telly mind's bigger. But with these three players, it was like, you've done av- that, have you? Right, watch this, hold my beer kind of thing. And they just kept up in each other, which just be- where some of the matches were just unbelievable to watch. You're just going, surely this is not where we're going to. And <laughs> did. And then you just left their open mouths going, for a player, like I play, you know, I play in my spare time, but I'm watching going, if I've got aspirations for this, how am I going to get to that level? Because these are levels that have not been seen this regular. Yes, there has been inst- instances where you had you had the Taylor Lewis match where they were both throwing unbelievable darts and the stats. For the Grand were, Slam. Yeah. And but that was one match. This feels like each week it was like something spectacular happened every week. You know, but the nine darts are in Manchester. Or, you know, the game between Rob Cross and Gerwin. Luke Humphreys. And and the game with Luke Humphreys, where they were just pummeling each other on the dartboard. But what I noticed more was, and we'll go into this when we discuss the finals, was there wasn't a drama. Because usually, you know, there's a bit of needle between players, like how they interview afterwards and things like that. But I didn't get that feeling. I just thought this was basically... The best players are coming to perform and play their best darts, and whoever wins, well done. And that and that's how it should be. I mean, this has been probably the greatest advert for darts, and we have spoken about this with European tour events on the uh, on the weekly podcast show. And it just felt as when the weeks went by, it just felt this is not just a show. It's not just an exhibition. I mean. These are playing a tremendous stats and they're congratulating each other, which adds, I don't remember that being part of the uh, the norm of the story of a Premier League for a, a particular year. It was always the rivalry. They don't like each other. It was a bit more WWE or boxing. It, this, But this just felt like you're putting two darting gladiators in there and they don't care what the other person's doing. They're just concentrating on their game. And if their game's good enough, then they're going to win. But they congratulated each other on whoever won. And it was nice and refreshing. And I think when we went into when you looked at the uh, confirmed Premier League lineup, I already assumed that players like Luke Humphreys and Michael Smith would already show these characteristics anyway, because you've seen them show this in previous competitions when obviously Smith lost all those numerous finals he played in before he ended up winning. He was always, even though he cried at the end of the final, he was um, very gracious in defeat. And uh, we've also seen it with Luke Humphreys with the UK Open final earlier on in the year when he faced Dimitri Vandenberg. Um, because a lot of people were annoyed with how Vandenberg operated in that final. But yet again, I remember saying at that time that Vandenberg was right in terms of what he did because every player has their routine. And you look at previous Premier Leagues in the past with, I remember the Gurney Price scrap um, a few years ago. I don't know where that was, but there was also the uh, older rivalries as well. You remember Taylor and Manley and Lewis and Manley as well. You've seen all these occasions where uh, the players haven't got on very well when they're playing each other but you look at the Premier League this year and as you've mentioned all of it has been played in a very good spirit and that's credit to the players that were taking part exactly exactly so that was the the 16 weeks and obviously we had the confirmed finalists for the playoffs where Luke Littler was at the top then Luke Humphreys then Michael Van Gerwen and Michael Smith in fourth so we headed to the bright lights of London, and just here's a little intro for that. Players, 16 
nights, 112 matches, one nine data, and four averages over 110. It all comes to this. It's the finals night of the Premier League darts at the O2 in London. The O2 with some fans ready for the Premier League finals. Who do you think's going to win? I reckon Lou Lilla. Who do you think? Lou Lilla. Lou Lilla. I'm going to Lou Humphries. That'd be different. Controversial, controversial. <laughs> Well, we hope you have a fantastic night here at the Premier League Arts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Robbie, one of the fans here waiting for the finals of the Premier League Arts. And who do you think is going to win today? Um, I was hoping it was going to be Nathan Espinel, but certainly he lost uh, the last game. Last yes. last yes. game. So um, I'm thinking uh, Michael Smith will, uh, will get, get this one. Michael Smith, one of the picks that we haven't heard, it's all been Luke, Little, Luke Humphries, it all seems to be the tail of two loops. But you're going with Mike Smith, the bully boy. Yes, indeed, I think he, he, won, he won the first Premier League uh, game, he won the uh, previous, previous one as well, so I think now he's speaking, so that's why I, uh, I go with him. And Dom, do you think he's going to win? Well, I'd like Michael Smith to win. That's the second one in a row, we've had Luke Little, we've had Luke Humphries, but... We've had a couple come out. It's gonna be Bully Boy. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Another fan of Bully Boy. So I am here with Chef Lucy at the Premier League Darts. And what's on the menu tonight? Um, we just had noodles. That's all I can do. <laughs> Too basic. <laughs> and who do you think is going to win tonight, Lucy? Oh, we gotta go little, have we? We have gotta go little. That was my pick in the predictions league, and Lucy agrees. Yeah. I have found the Cape Crusader Batman here, otherwise known as Jamie. Jamie, how are you doing? I'm very good, I'm very good. So, big question, who do you think is going to win tonight? Luke or Van Gogh? Which Luke? Little. Luke Little. So you think the youngest one in the tournament is going to win it? Yeah. Young Beta? Pardon me? And who do you think is going to win tonight? We hope uh, Michael van Gerwen, but I think Humphries. Humphries. Yeah. And I have to say Michael Forgerman. And I'm sure that Michael Forgerman will win this night. He's always good. He is always good on finals night. Yeah, that's why he's got seven and hopefully eight tonight. Yeah, yes, yes. yes. That's great. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're here with more fans for the Premier League finals nights. And who have we got? I reckon Little is winning tonight. Yeah. Little, Little. Yeah. So that's Mario, what does Luigi think? I reckon it as well. I reckon it will be a tight game between him and Smith, but I think he'll power through and win there. And Hawaii 501? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to back Little from that. I reckon he's got it in him. Excellent stuff. Well, so there we I was with all the fans and getting their picks, and Michael Smith's name kept coming up more often than not, which was uh, probably more of a show of respect because. As you said in the predictor in the predictions, Michael Smith seemed to have Luke Littler's number in the league format on more than one occasion. So I think a lot of people are looking into that, but the format was longer. And in the prediction league, I did say this probably helps Luke Littler more than Michael Smith because Luke Littler can have a run of three, four legs where he could eat at that throw. And that proves to be the case with Luke Littler versus Michael Smith. It was a great game. It was definitely a great game, and Littler definitely was the player in that contest that uh, flew out the gates quicker. And I remember that, that was one of the reasons why I did predict, uh, when you mentioned the head-to-head -head record between the two players, that was one of the reasons why I did sway towards the Michael Smith side. It was seven meetings, I think, between the two in the whole of the 16 weeks played, and Smith won five of them, so it was severely in his favour. However, you did mention the long formats. Littler, of course, we saw at the World Championship when he was playing in the set format with uh, legs that were sorry games that were going up towards twelve legs, four to uh, fifteen legs with the set format. And we also saw at the UK Open as well how he handled himself with that format, which is pretty much the same format as the yeah. uh, Premier League finals night. And we saw that if you let this kid go four, uh, three legs, four legs ahead, the chances are you're probably not going to be coming back. And Michael Smith found that out in the first semi. Yeah, I mean, semi-final result 10-5 to Luke Littler. Luke averaging just literally just over 100 and Matt Smith just being five points behind. But that five points is... It's nothing really. It's just an extra data, a double, but it just shows the 
monstrous scoring that Luke Littler has been, now been known to to come up with. Yeah, and there was stages where, like, you look at some of the ma- uh, some of the legs where Luke Littler did throw first, and Michael Smith was getting the opportunities at the double, but they just weren't going for him in that game. And on another day, he might have found those doubles, and it would have been a lot closer in terms of the scoreline, but he couldn't find them. And with all the legs that were going towards Littler, you just could tell with Michael Smith that he was just thinking in his head that maybe this just wasn't his day. And I'm sure he's definitely going to be, he's got the World Cup to look forward to in a month's time as well, because we saw the uh, selected pairings for the World Cup get announced. He yes. will be with Luke Humphreys for that. Um, but in terms of that match, it was, it was, it went to the rightful winner. Luke Littler was the one that, was seven free up at the first at the break, and he all he had to do was get the further free legs. I think Smith won two more after the break, but Littler was always ahead, and he didn't let Smith back into it. Yeah, it was a it was a a case of um, three facts in life: you don't spit in the wind, you don't tug on Superman's cape, and you don't leave Luke Little with forty with three darts in his hand. <laughs> No, you don't, because even if he misses that tops, he's got double turn straight after, and we know how exactly. much he loves that double. Exactly, exactly. Moving on to the second semi-final, Luke Humphreys versus Michael Van Gerwen. Again, tense start for both players, but then Luke Humphreys, as we as he's done in the past, flipped the switch and just kept eating at the Michael Van Gerwen throw, and then it just he just ran away with it. I would say this is a bit of dark deja vu from the first semi-final. If you look at the uh, the way it went about, it was quite close early on, and then you look at and then one and then the Luke in the tie pulls away yes. from the Michael in the tie, and yes. in the end, it was a case of Luke Luke Humphreys leading. I think well, he was leading seven three at the at the break, just like Luke was in the first semi-final. And then you look at the performance that Luke Humphreys was before was playing in the first, early before the first break, and he was averaging like 109, 110 after the first five, six legs. And you could just tell that he was definitely up for this semi-final and he wanted to add that Premier League into the, well, he won the World Championship. He's looking for that holy trinity. Yes. And, you know, that average again, popping up 110. I mean, uh, final was, uh, sorry, the final average, should I say, was 101. And again, you know, two points in it between the two Lukes and two points in it between the two Mikes. It was just one of the, uh, you know, we said Dave Javu, but it's Luke Javu and Mike Javu. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but then we moved on to the final, and what a final. What a promotion for this sports. I mean, these two just produced match. After, as Luke Humphrey said at the, fi- at the end of the game, these two are going to have many entertaining battles in the future we saw it at the world championship final and we've seen it again in the premier league final and it was fitting that it was those two in the final they were two in the league um and they were both on their day which is even which is even madder yeah it's i mean they they played each other on the first night and then they played each other on the final night it i ran out of superlatives for it and you know it was nip and tuck they were both I'm not going to say nervous. Uh, it was just a game of respect. Uh, that, uh, that the first ten legs, there was that. There was a bit of nerves. It was a bit of tension. It was a bit of playing the occasion. It just was. I mean, they were both playing superbly well, but it wasn't their A games. And you could tell it was. It was going to be who blinked first, and then yeah, they had the break, and then Luke Humphreys blinked and. <laughs> The whole world went Can mad. Can you call it a blink, though? It was an absolute, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, after that first that first session of the game, it was a case of, um, I think there was one break of throw for Humphreys, one break of throw for Littler. It was, and you know what I will say as well, is that I remember that first night in Cardiff where there was the whistles all over the place. That final was played with the utmost respect, both not from just the players, but also the fans as well. I was just about to say, when you mentioned that, I was going, this reminded me, and I'm an old, I'm an old fart, it reminded me of the lakeside, where the respect when they were throwing, it wasn't silent, but it wasn't rough, it was and there wasn't any whistling or any shenanigans from the crowd. They was watching, like me. There was going, we're witnessing something special here, and I think from leg three, 
Uh, sorry, when it went three three, I think the crowd suddenly realised this is something different. This is not a party atmosphere. This is they were there to watch, and all fourteen thousand of them were glued to the action, and that is probably one of the best things that could happen in this situation. And I think that's what Blue Littler continues to do for this sport. And after that break, it was 5 all. Nothing was splitting them in the game. And I was thinking at the end of it, who is going to blink first? I thought it was going to be a case of Littler winning because he had the throw at the first leg. And it it looked like a case of none of them could break each other. Exactly. Last leg decider. Winning the bullseye was the big thing for him. Yeah. And it, it, I thought that was going to be the big telling factor. And then comes up, uh, the break finishes and then, and Luke Littler on his throw. Uh, both players hit a 180 to start the leg. Luke Littler follows with a 180. Humphreys is uh, threatening the repeat of the 2023 final between Smith and Van Gogh, where they were both on a nine. I think it yes. was one treble that went in. And then Littler <laughs> comes back spend. to the 141. And yeah. you get the nine data, second nine data of the Premier League as well. And it's mad that that was his first ever final of the Premier League. And Guess what? To settle the nerves, he gets a nine data. Yeah, I think he. I think he just needed that nine data just to you know <laughs> step in. <laughs> no, um, I, yeah, and it was a fantastic shot, of course. Yeah, and then the next leg, I think he it, it was one forties, and it, it. We was just I was watching it backstage and watching it. it I was flipping going into the arena and then you know going to get stuff ready for um, post match. Oh, I just was going, surely not, surely not. And and it's not, I was going to say it wasn't just Luke, but it was Luke as well. It wasn't just Luke Littler that was performing outrageous starts. Luke Humphries was still performing in top gear, but I think it just might be Luke had the nitros boost on, uh, Luke Littler that is, had the, the nitros boost and that's just what edged him, edged him away. You look at the nine data and I think when Luke Humphreys probably saw that go, it was like, well, I'm playing everything. I'm playing to my usual standard here, but this guy is is hitting another level at the minute. And I I think after that, the nine data was the thing that, in my opinion, won Luke Littler the uh, Premier League. And in terms of what happened after that, uh, after that nine data, he broke the Humphreys throw. So you could tell that maybe... Um, the nine data was stinging him still a little bit, and yeah. then it was back on throw again, and then little broke again, and it was like, yeah, he's he's got him where he wanted him. Exactly, and you know, again, I'm watching these two guys play, and a lot of things have been said of like rivalries, and you know, sometimes darts need the rivalries and they need the needle and stuff. Where you had Taylor Barney going tete a tete after their semi final, and you've had Gary Anderson go in price incidents, and as we said famously with Adrian Lewis, Peter Mandler. I'm watching these two guys play, and they are throwing everything you know, obviously, they're throwing darts. But they are throwing everything at each other, kitchen sinks, you name it, in as much as they can. But they played it as professionally, you know, they just concentrated on their darts. Does they're not bothering what the other person's doing? It's just get down to zero, you know, next leg. But the the way that they were reacting with each other just in performance, where you know, you've done that, right? Watch this. But then you go when Luke Littler hits tops to win the title. The reaction of both players was just mutual respect, mutual congratulate, you know, Luke Humphreys congratulating Luke Littler. And in the interview, the, it was a flip reversal. Luke Littler said to Luke Humphreys, enjoy this moment, celebrate, blah, blah, blah. And then when Luke Littler wins, Luke Humphreys says the exact same words to him. So... When I was um, at the press conferences for both Luke Humphries and Luke Littler, a lot of the press were asking questions about rivalries, where and they were asking, do you think Luke Littler, when they were asking Luke Humphries, do you think Luke Littler is going to be your biggest rival and vice versa? And I kept, I was there and I'm going, this is not the right term. It didn't feel like the right term because they're not rivals. So they, they want to both be the best player in the world because that is what any darts if you're into darts and you're going into this level of darts that is your goal you want to be the best player in the world 
Now, you're going to be playing against a whole host of people, but you're traveling to all the same places. You're traveling, so you're going to make friends, and you might not like certain people, but you've got to play them week in, week out. But with these two, I don't see this as a rivalry. I see it as a competition, definitely, but they're definitely not rivals, and it's not going to be where you've got, you know, yeah. Ali and Frazier kind of thing where, you know, you have this animosity and things like that. These are frenemies, to put it better, where they are extremely good friends off the hockey and they'll play the darts. So, you know, when it says game on, they will play darts. They won't, but they won't put each other off or anything like that. And that was one of the questions that really baffled me last night was when they say that when Luke Littler is playing to this level, is there anything you can do? And I thought that was just such a bizarre question because, you know, yes, you're playing for thousands and thousands of pounds, but these don't worry about that. They're, they're in a fortunate position not to worry about that. But these just want to play the best darts and they want to prove that they are the best dart player. And to do that, you play the best darts. And I think these two will be tremendous frenemies where or rivals, <laughs> they're going to be. It's going to be one of the friendliest rivalries where, yeah, they will be competing to their absolute best, and whoever wins wins. But as far as anything else, that's it. I mean, we've seen it week by week on the pre-shows that they have, and you know they're just talking to each other, showing each other the darts, and they're going, "Oh, you're using the different flights, you're using a different point, blah blah blah." That is not what rivals do. Rivals will go, I'm not showing you my stuff. You know, it's like, this is my setup. You have, you know, these two are just genuine friends and it just so happens that there's two best players in the world currently. Yeah, you see with Luke Humphries and Luke Littler, every time they play, when they take to the hockey, there's the utmost respect between the two when they're playing in these high quality and high tension situations in big matches in tournaments all across the year. I remember when we were, I was in the press conference and night 15 and Luke Humphreys um, was asked about a bit like what the reporters were saying when you were at the finals night. And they were, he was saying that me and Luke have the utmost respect for each other and I love him to bits. And I remember hearing that and thinking, this is not like, this is like, you look at all the rivalries in the past and it's just, a, it's got a completely different feel to it. And then yeah. I think twenty four, like a day or two after that press conference, there was a tweet that came out from both players, and it was just the same. It was the same tweet. It was an emoji which was there to show that they were both united with um, what with the respect that they've got for each other when they're on the hockey. Yeah, and I think this is a new age of darts, a new era where it all seems. You get the clips, you get your bums on seats by creating these rivals. And I think it's the journalists. And if you want to come at me, <laughs> you know, do so. But my Don't come at me. Is, Don't come at me. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not a journalist. <laughs> but uh. I've, I think this is coming into a new era of darts where it is not about the rivals. And the key want to push this story or this analogy that the rivals... And it's not. It's just really who is the best art player. You don't need to have rivals. You've got four of the greatest players playing on that in that finals night. And then you go to we've got the match play coming up. We've got the World Cup. You've got the Grand Prix. You've got all these players who are throwing some phenomenal stuff. Let the darts do the talking. Let the darts be the darts. It doesn't matter. If you know such a body doesn't like and you know whoever else, I don't care about that. I want my stats. I want my one eighties. I want my one seventy checkouts. I want my nine darters. And if these players can do it, then let's bloody show it. Yeah, and you look. There's been. I I I think I've heard a phrase off someone that is very close to this show, and he was saying that never give your opponent. The, uh, any reason to beat you and maybe that is one of the reasons why there is the utmost respect between the players but you look at games in the past and I remember that match at the World Championships when COVID was on between Anderson and Suljevic when Suljevic went to the wrong table and Anderson was like nah I'm beating you for that and there was also an occasion <laughs> where and there was also an occasion where Chris Doby I think uh, played Gary Anderson 
uh, Gary Anderson again at the uh, World Championships. And I think Anderson, he mentioned this in an interview after the match, saying that Anderson had said something to him. And Doby said in the interview afterwards, was like, yeah, I'm beating you now for that. For saying that, I'm beating you for that. And when you look at the respect that Littler and Humphreys have got on the stage, maybe it's a fact that they don't want to tick each other off in terms of uh, giving the other reason, giving the other player another reason to beat you. But with darts, anything can happen. And when the game is played with the utmost respect, you haven't got a clue what's going to happen. No, and and I think this is a, a new era. And it might be, you know, as you say, I just want my darts to do the talking and... You, you don't want to get into a war of words or anything like that because it takes the, it takes the fun out of the game because the only thing that's going to happen is your standard's going to drop because there's going to be needle involved or you know whatever gamesmanship tactics whatever which has been the past. overthink it well exactly it's just going to be I just want to play darts so I'll play my darts and if my darts is good enough great if it's not I'm going to be the first person to congratulate him because it's going to take someone to perform to a special level or do something very special to beat me and if that's the case there's my hand that's how it should be and I just find it really refreshing but before we go into more tangents and I'm calling out journalists <laughs> I think we should go to the post-match interviews with both Luke Humphreys and the champion Luke Littler uh, First of all I just want to say thank you for a great endorsement of darts and a great advert for darts it was a tremendous night for all the players and for obviously you and Luke and you've got to say the future is pardon upon Luke in very bright. Yeah, well, if you're not a Luke, you're just living in a Luke world, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I have to put my best Bolton accent on to say it, but uh, but during that final, obviously there was that turn of the after the break with the nine data, and apart from the kitchen sink, I mean, you say you've got the game to to beat him, but it, it just seemed to be he just went on a crest yeah, of a wave. I mean, of course, I, was, I think uh, after the tenth leg, if he did play that well, I probably would have won the game. Yes, I think. I started all of a sudden playing really well. The breeze stopped a little bit, and I was able to play my own game. And you see that if he didn't play as well as he did, I could have been uh, level seven winner. But he showed a level of, of his game that I couldn't get quite get hold of. And, uh, you know that was the difference to be honest. But if, if, it, if he would have done what he did, then I could have. If, if he would have played like he did the previous ten legs, and I carried on playing like I did, I probably would have won. But I didn't. He played better, and that was the, that was the key. So I thought it was a fantastic game. We both give it our best, and uh, you know it was a great outlook for, for the sport to us. I think there's going to be many, many major finals. Really. I'm I'm really looking forward to each final, and yeah. thank you very much for I'm a great night. Yeah, uh, Luke, having watched and played against you many years ago in the Swinton League. Uh, <laughs> from them formative years and watching you ascend to the top of the Premier League, you must be very proud of your accomplishments. Yeah, um, well, like I said, the Swindon League, um, those days I was out every day of the week. And obviously, there was competitions on the weekend where you were out as well. Um, but that's where all the practice pays off, doing it every day. And do you think it was mainly from COVID where you, you practice game, where you upped your practice game phenomenally, playing on Facebook Live way back then? You think that's just getting the reps in and that's what's built you up into this scoring monster? <laughs> that's what that's what really did it for me, COVID. I was just non-stop on the board. Um, as well, my older brother he just stopped playing darts. Um, but if he continues to practice, it may have been two letters, but there's only one. And what does a 17 year old do with £250,000? <laughs> <laughs> so there are the interviews with both Luke's, uh, Luke Humphreys and Luke Littler, and Luke seems to remember where he's come from, from the Swinton League to the Premier League, doing it on a Thursday night, and you know, it was, um, having known Luke for, Littler for a long time, as I've watched him progress, for, as we said, from the Swinton League and playing in local events. And then when COVID hit, you know, obviously everyone was in a bit of turmoil. I lost, I was a cafe manager at the time and then I wasn't all of a sudden, but everyone tried, was practicing. For me, you know, a lot of players were just at home practicing because they had the time on their hands and people had different things. You had the JDC camera, um, their routine and then you had a lot of online leagues propped up you've got the gdl which is still thriving and doing very well to this day 
And then you had, um, is it Aussie Darts doing challenge matches online? Yes, and Luke, yes. Like, yeah, and Luke Littler was in and amongst all of this. And then he was just flicking his camera on Facebook Live, hitting record, and just playing against the computer, playing against people. And you could see he was getting... And these were not just like an hour stream. This was eight hour streams, this. And if someone's playing that long and getting that many reps in, of course your game is going to develop and going to grow. And then he was, and then, you know, between then and now, he started to do really well in the WDF, winning British Opens, British Classics, and tournaments abroad. And then obviously dominating the JDC. And then there was the progression onto Modus, and you know you saw he was two two. He struggled, he struggled a bit in that, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, the one that got me the and again, I'm sorry for this episode being a, a love fest for Luke Littler, but he has deserved it. I'm not being fudder. After watching him last night, he's deserved this. But the one that got me, uh, which but made me laugh the most, and I'm just going, this kid is unreal. Where. He was in Group A, and he already qualified by day two. So he literally had five games on day three where it didn't matter because he's already through. So he thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get my dad starts, and I'm going to do 111 checkout, bull 11 bull. And I'm going, the audacity of this kid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... I've known it was coming a long time ago. Having watched him play and played against him a couple of times, you could see the talent was there. And he had, and his family have done tremendously well looking after him because, you know, kids can be kids. And if you, you know, you're going into this situation where you're making a lot of money for anybody, let alone someone who was 15, 16, he, he's very well level, grounded. And his management company have done their best for him. And you can see it's it's a full team there that are looking after him and they're looking after his best interests. And you can see it's paying dividends. I mean, the performances have been unreal. He's only a Pro Tour card holder for five months. He's already won Pro Tour, European Tour, World Series event, and now a ma major of the Premier League, and he's also hit a nine data in all of them events. So the moment Luke Halitler hits a nine data in events, lump on him winning it because that's your stat. Yeah, you look at obviously you mentioned the rise of Luke Littler in terms of the COVID situation. I think a lot of players benefited from the COVID uh, pandemic period because before yeah. COVID, it was a case of I feel like a lot of ways in darts in terms of progression it was a lot county based whereas the covid era sort of highlighted the facts of individual like to focus more on the individual player and then we've had the likes of the adc come in we've had the moda super series which you mentioned come in and of course Littler was doing it on the wdf as well i remember um it took richard vainstra to get the best average ever on the lakeside stage just to get rid of him early in the tournament it was like 104 or something so you just knew from that, that game on was that Littler was going to be something special and it was just a case of when he was going to be making that step from playing on the WDF, playing in the amateur scene and moving into the professional scene. And he's taken that step. And when he's got into the professional circuit, as we saw at the World Championships, it took him one match and he introduced himself just like that. Yeah, I remember that match against uh, Christian Kist because that uh, would have been a Tuesday night no, Wednesday it was. It was a Wednesday night because I was playing interleague on the Manchester board. We was playing against the Eccles League, and that game stopped. I think it because we had to play ten matches, and it was only one leg, so I don't. But I think it was the halfway point. We got to five, and then the game literally stopped because everyone's attention was on Luke Littler, and from that moment on, with my podcasting head on, I'm going. I think we've come in at the right time for us personally doing this podcast because we are going into a boom period of darts. And there's been many examples of this where, you know, you've got all these dart schools cropping up left, right and centre. And I've mentioned it once, but one of the most telling factors for me, I play my darts and I am a bit of a dart nerd, if you might not have got it already. But when I go to a sports shop, I always go, what, what darts have they got? 
And usually in, in a sports direct, the darts are right at the back, past the golf clubs, past the snooker stuff, caked in dust, you know, it's and you've got a set of the, the Gary Anderson phase four at twenty seven ninety nine, something like that. I even remember when you were getting the shirt and you went up to the Liverpool and you were in the Liverpool uh Super yeah. store. You went up to the Liverpool darts, and I'm just <laughs> out there thinking, AJ, do not buy them darts. Whatever you do, do not buy they them. Customize. They did. I know Even one though of they were unicorn, mate. Yes. But do not buy them. <laughs> I was going. That's a T90 that's been repainted. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so knowing where the darts was usually kept, as we said, I had to go to a sports direct to get my son's a new bag for high school. Usually going to the main part of the store is obviously the front doors, and that's where you have your high level um, kits. So you had your Man United kits, you had your Man City kits, you've got your Premier League footballs, and then to the right of that, on a full column, full display, dart, dartboards, surrounds. I'm like, blimey, this is this is the little effect that we've mentioned time and time again. So. Your new darts was in a massive upswing. And then Luke Little becomes the face of a breakfast cereal because why not? And then Luke Little is on the Jonathan Ross show with Millie Bobby Ray. Is that right? Uh, from Millie Strange Bobby Girls. Brown. Millie Bobby Brown, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Show me age. Uh, <laughs> but you know, he was <laughs> he was being he was being thrusted into the limelight and there may have been some occasions of adhering headlights. I mean, where I think the episode, that episode of the Jonathan Ross, I think it was very, it was quiet, but he was still responsive and he conducted himself very, very well. And then he was on comedy. Very professionally. Room. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But for, and not just for a 17 year old, I mean, for anybody. I mean, to be put in that situation where darts players, uh, it's, you know, it's not the big show in town. But now it is becoming the big show in town. It's getting the more viewers than the Ashes. It's getting more viewers than Wimbledon. It's getting more viewers than you know Premier League football nights on some occasions. It is becoming the hottest ticket in town. And yes, Luke Littler is the focal point for that because he's winning these events. But for the sport of darts in general, to to kind of phrase by Yaz, the only way is up. <laughs> yeah absolutely the sport of darts is definitely going up you look at the viewing figures that were shown at the world championship final it was just short of five mil viewers and then fourteen thousand people are crowded in to watch Littler and Humphreys again playing the O2 arena and it's darts is one of them sports as the standard rises you look at when you see Van Gerwen and Smith and Littler and Humphreys all in their prime it's a case of blink and you'll miss it and that's maybe one of the reasons why the final of the Premier League was played in such high regard, like the utmost respect, like I said, from the fans as well as the players. And may uh, it was also maybe a fact that the fans just were glued to what was going on within the darts and the standard was that good. As I said, you blink and you don't pay attention to for more than five seconds and you're going to miss so much. And yeah, if you weren't paying attention to Luke Lazarin Darter, then unlucky. Yeah, it was great. It was great. And there was no boring, boring tables or whatever. There was none of that. It was people there watching darts, 14,000 sets of eyes watching a grand spectacle and a great advert for the game that we love, essentially. Yeah. So that was the Premier League that was, but there's something that I'm missing. Does it involve what I'm wearing by any chance? It could do. It could do. What was it? Oh, yeah. Double or nothing. Let's see how that stupid. went down. <laughs> Let's see how that went down. Part. So, with the double or nothing, the bet was if Harry won, then I would have to wear the Liverpool shirt at some point. And if I won, Harry had to wear it again. How did that go, Harry? <sighs> well, obviously you can just you just have to look at AJ to know how, uh, what way it went in terms of the predictions. And yes, obviously I am fulfilling the forfeit of the first predictor league. 
but I've gone and lost a double or nothing as well because I decided last week to challenge AD to a double or nothing. It's failed miserably, and guess what? Coming soon, I'll be wearing this shirt again at some point. You, you didn't. can't stop smiling, can you? <laughs> you didn't Luke into the results, did you? <laughs> I did predict one Luke, but unfortunately it wasn't the right one. Yeah, it's all jokes aside, you know, this has been a fantastic... I mean, yes, Harry was fuming with the way he lost the first predictor league, but as he said, he, he can't really argue with someone throwing a nine data and a 107 average in the final. Yeah. <laughs> it's more deserved. As I, as, I, as I mentioned, it was a case of a nine data that's making me wear this shirt again. And you know what? That is absolutely fine. It was a fantastic, like after as it was, it was so close between the two in the final. In terms of after the first break, it was te- it was five all, nothing to split them. I thought it I might have worried. come down to. I was worried. I... <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought you might have been all right because you said Littler to win, and obviously he had the throw in the final. So I genuinely, as I said earlier on in the episode, I thought that Littler was going to win via the uh, having the throw and winning the final leg on his throw, but the nine data. And then he wins the following leg to break Humphreys and he gets that two leg cushion and it's, he's got the advantage now and he used it fully. He didn't, I don't think he lost his, even though I think Humphreys had a dart at tops to, for a one, four, five to break him on one occasion. It just literally was brutal on his own throw. He was not letting Humphreys have a sniff and he knew all he had to do was hold his throw for the remainder of the match. And he was going to be the premier league champion, which he is. Yes, so a massive congratulations to Luke Littler on his first TV major, on on his debut. And again, thank you to Luke Humphreys for making it a fantastic final. And thank you to all the players involved on this Premier League. It's definitely been one to remember. Where do we go from here? We've got the World Cup. We can't really do anything for the World Cup. Because there's too many, there's too many. I want to make it fair for you, Harry. I want to, you know, I don't want it down down to random. You know, it's. But we have got the world match play coming up, and it's Indeed. in, and it's in Blackpool. Now on the Saturday, of the match play, the first Saturday, I'm a little bit busy doing tough mudder for the Head Neck Cancer Foundation charity. So I'm going to leave a page in the descriptions of YouTube and of the podcast sites where if you want to make any donation, that would be muchly appreciated. It's going to a charity that's very close to me and uh, where I've, you know, we don't want to go into too many details, but it's just very, very close to me and someone very close who is suffering at this moment. If you can make any donation, again, I would be very, very grateful. But... That's a Saturday, but then we are both in Blackpool for the remainder of the match play. It should be different. I mean, Harry's now got used to the wearing the Liverpool shirt. You know, it's 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 more like a a second skin for him. And I think, but oh, whatever. With, <laughs> with it, but with it being in Blackpool, I think it's only fitting that we should have a fun fair forfeit. Do you know what? I think that forfeit sounds a lot better than what I'm doing now. I'd rather... Do you know what? This may sound really silly, but and it is it is football rivalry talking here, but throwing up after being on a ride like the teacups or something just sounds so much better than having to wear this filth that I've got on at the minute. I think that's a deal then. A fun fair forfeit in Blackpool. You'll be seeing AJ throwing up into some bucket on Blackpool Pleasure Beach. I won't be having any donuts or a wrap because that'll put me into into sleep mode, essentially. <laughs> so that is it for the Premier League this year. And just leaves me to say one thing. Happy birthday, Sarah. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And Happy birthday, that, Sarah. And that just leaves us to say it's game shot and match for this episode. My name is AJ Umston Tuft. And my name is Harry Masterson, and I'm getting this shirt off right away. <laughs> the three S's shirt, shower, shave. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
We'll see you in the next no, round. No, you had that one. In a bit, guys. <laughs> see you later. <laughs>